Ah, huh. this place looks different. Looks almost like it's on the other side of the world to where I usually am. Over the past few weeks I haven't made many videos, but there's a good reason for that. I found myself back in New Zealand, and I've also been spending a lot of time doing my own research. In that time, I've managed to condense some code I've been writing for about a year now into just two lines, where you can analyze data from any patch in the sky in just two lines. So you can turn something that looks like this into something that looks like that. How exciting. It may not seem like too much, but this is a pretty big step, at least for me, because it makes the barrier to entry for doing science with the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, much easier than what it usually is. And it's super helpful for me to be able to check and see if there is an interesting supernova that TESS has observed. This code is super easy for anyone to use, or at least that's how I've tried to structure it. So I've been thinking it might be fun to do a science stream in the future where we go through this code and try and find some interesting things that TESS has observed all across the sky. So if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in seeing, let me know in the comments and we'll try and work out a time when that works. Some other fun news as far as my research goes is that uh, three of the proposals that one of my groups put into the James Webb Space Telescope got accepted. So that's pretty exciting. It means there are three programs now that I'm a part of that will use JWST once it's up in space and hopefully functional. These three proposals are kind of all uh, about the same thing. They all want to use JWST to observe things called kilonova. And if you don't know, kilonova are the things that are produced by two neutron stars that slam together in the depths of space. We've seen one really cool kilonova with the LIGO gravitational wave detectors and all of the telescopes at humanity's disposal in 2017. So what we're hoping is that we'll get another really cool event like that that we can point JWST at and see all of the really cool bits of information that are hidden in the infrared light of these kilonova events. So though it's been accepted now, we've still got to play the waiting game of waiting for the web to launch, and of course, for such an event to actually be detected for us to follow up with the telescope. So there's a bit of luck involved, but I'm hopeful that we will get a little bit lucky. For those of you that are fans of calendars, you might have noticed that April 1st occurred not too long ago. And there's been a tradition that's developed in astronomy over the past few years of astronomers publishing papers onto Archive, which is like our scientific paper database that's open access to everyone, that are just jokes. They approach a topic and um, just have fun with it. And it's always interesting to see how these joke ideas can actually have some really cool nuggets of science buried in them. So I thought for this year, we'll go through two of my favorite joke papers from the Archive, the first paper we'll look at is one called Detection of Rotational Variability in Floofy Objects at Optical Wavelengths. This paper is really cool because it approaches the idea of how we actually use images to try and understand the surfaces of rotating objects like asteroids, stars, or even these new mysterious floofy objects. But before we get into the paper and look at some of the figures, let's read a section of the abstract. Rotational variations have been detected in several types of astronomical bodies, beyond those of planetary mass, including asteroids, brown dwarfs, and stars. Unexpected rotational variations such as those presented in this work reminds us that the universe can be complicated with more mysteries to uncover. In this work, we present evidence for a new class of astronomical objects we identify as floofy with observational distinctions between several subtypes of these poorly understood objects. Using optical observations contributed by the community, we have identified rotational variation in several of these floofy objects, which suggests that they may have strong differences between their hemispheres, likely caused by differing reflectivity of their surfaces. While the work here is a promising step toward the categorization of floofy objects, further observations with more strictly defined limits on background light, illumination angles, and companion objects are necessary to develop a better understanding of the many remaining mysteries of these astronomical objects. 
So that's a fantastic abstract, probably one of the best I've read. And this paper goes into describing how we use mathematics to try and describe the surface features of rotating objects with photometry. And figure two is probably one of the best scientific figures I have ever seen. In this figure, they classify the longitude of their floofy objects, where you have non-belly regions and belly regions. So they split up their images into these different categories, and then they can do some mathematics on them. And using images like these lovely ones we have here from a whole series of different cats, they're able to construct the rotational light curves of these floofy objects. Where in some cases, they're brighter on one side than the other. And in these cases, we know from the images, this is usually where the belly is. So this paper is a pretty fun way to try and understand the how it is that we use images to identify surface features on rotating objects. So if you're interested, I've left a link to this paper in the description of the video, and it's a pretty fun one to read. But the next paper we're going to look at is called I'll Finish It This Week and Other Lines. Now this paper is really cool because it's what I would probably consider almost worth publishing in an actual journal, not just as a joke article on Archive for April Fools. The premise behind this article is that they wanted to explore how likely it is that you actually finish something on time, say, if I said it would take me one week to make a video, and then it turns out it takes me a few weeks to actually make that video. What is that lag between when you expect it to happen and when it actually happens? And they do this study for people self-reporting their own completions of tasks across the whole range of academia, from undergrads to postdocs like myself. So it's really awesome to see how the expectations of how quickly we'll be able to finish things actually pan out, and how long things tend to drag on for. So in this paper, a group of intrepid researchers identified tasks, and they start time of the task, when they expected to finish the task, and then of course recorded when they actually finished the task. And then we could see what the distribution would be like. They checked a few things like, did an undergrad make worse or better predictions of their time management than a, say, postdoc? And what they found is that a postdoc is generally a little bit more uh, accurate with their predictions of how long things will take, but not really so much. So everyone is kind of underestimating how long it actually takes to do things. So it's kind of reassuring, for me at least, to see that as things drag on and on in time that I'm not the only one that has trouble finishing things when I thought I would be able to. But there's also a really cool breakdown figure in figure 3 that shows how these different aspects of the workload change for the different levels in academia. So an undergrad, a grad student, like a PhD student, and a postdoc, like myself. You can see that the pie is taken up by different activities as the seniority of the student increases. Probably the most obvious change is that as you go from undergrad to grad to postdoc, the number of problem sets you need to do are reduced to zero. But in its place arise a few different things for postdocs, like preparing talks, reading articles like this one, and um, of course writing about all of the various things that you're doing, or at least supposed to be doing. So I thought this paper was really cool to see how we all tend to underestimate how long things take and uh, how it breaks down these different tasks for the different groups. So if you're interested to see how our expectations perhaps should be managed a little bit better, or how the workload changes over time in academia, then I suggest you check out this paper as well. I've left a link to this one as well in the description. So those were my two favorite joke papers that were put on archive for April Fool's Day. They're really good, and hopefully we'll see more of those in future years. And myself, like many other astronomers, aspire to one day writing an April Fool's paper to put on archive. But before I do that, I first need to think of something funny to actually write about. And I also need to write about the research I'm supposed to be doing. But if you were to write a joke paper and put it on archive, what topic would you choose? Let me know in the comments, I'll be very interested to see 
what kind of ideas you'll have and perhaps I could steal one of them and we could become co-authors in the future. But for now, thank you for watching the video and I hope to see you next time.